Um, hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm an engineer, which is kind of a strange thing to uh, be involved in conservation work. Um, but you know, I, my, my day job is I'm a satellite propulsion engineer. So that basically means that I use rocket science to help get satellites and other unmanned spacecraft from Earth into the orbital slot that they need to sit in. Um, and it was when I went to Stanford where I really kind of saw the real issue behind what's going on with our oceans. Um, and it was there that I, I saw a, a good fit for a technology-based solution. So the tragedy of our ocean commons. Our oceans are at this very unique point right now. And they have a, a different kind of conservation challenge than maybe some of like the terrestrial challenges. And part of the reason why is, is because of this. A lot of the times when people look out at the oceans, they see just this. They see the surface. Um, so it makes it a little difficult to demonstrate the dire need in protecting the species under there when most people just look out and they only see this. So um, I wish it was just as easy to look out here and, and tell the number of bluefin tuna remaining you know, as we can look out and see how many black rhino or Mexican gray wolf are still out there. So overfishing. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard the statistics on how bad it really truly is. But the overfishing and illegal fishing is currently kind of the greatest risk we have to our ocean and coastal ecosystems. Not only that, but it has huge implications on global food security. Um, and it could really, really cause a huge, huge issue in our future. And so I'm sure you've heard the statistics before. You know, 90% of our large fish have disappeared. Um, we can possibly get to the point in this century where global uh, food, uh, fish stocks could collapse. And our current fishing fleet is about two and a half times what our, the capacity of our planet can sustainably handle. So what can we do to change this? Well, to get into that, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a story. Um, I went to Palau in 2009 with, with Stanford University. And the point of the trip was to really talk to the people of Palau about entrepreneurship. But we had a focus that we wanted to talk to them about how they can do things to um, improve their environment and improve their economy at the same time. We called the series of meetings we had Green Palau. Um, and my whole purpose there was to talk about how they could use technology, um, specifically low-cost technology, to uh, help protect this pristine environment you see behind me here. It was really a perfect time to be there, too. We, we came right after uh, Plow's president stood up in front of the UN General Assembly and declared all of Plow's waters a shark sanctuary. So that 600,000 square kilometers right there was a shark sanctuary. Well, while I was in Palau, I had a chance to do some field work, and I was talking to a lot of the people there about the current state of their oceans and really what, what they thought um, was going on out there. Um, and and I, I got the chance to talk to quite a few people, you know, people that you would think would have a better idea about what was going on in their oceans. And I, and I got to ask them, in your opinion, how many boats do you actually think are out there that Palau doesn't know about? Like, how many vessels do we have out on that water that are unaccounted for? And um, you know, the numbers that I got were low. I, I had people telling me a handful, maybe four or five, that they didn't actually know were out there. Um, but luckily, at that same time, Australia uh, was flying a military vessel in the area. And they took some data, as they did. And just in that one single flight path, they found um, over 70 unaccounted for vessels in Palau's water. So there's this really huge perception problem there. Well, so how does Palau protect that? That 600,000 square kilometer shark sanctuary? You're looking at it. One patrol boat. A single boat to patrol all of that area. So you have this one coastal nation that has a 600,000 square kilometer shark sanctuary. It's often considered one of the seven wonders of the underwater world. And not only that, they've signed on to the Micronesia Challenge, which would protect over 30% of their coastal waters, all to be protected by a single boat. Do you think that that could be done? You see, this Palau problem is not unique to that country. It's, it's really an issue that we have across the board. Uh, the way that we go about protecting our waters is, is based on technology and methods that's decades old. We use donated or purchased military vessels to 
patrol the coasts and sometimes take somewhat arbitrary paths. We rely on borrowing some time as a secondary mission on military aircraft. Um, and, and these things cost in the hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars per flight. We uh, look at cooperative systems where we have vessel tracking information that's sent from the vessels, and those are kept in different databases, and much of this information is not shared amongst each other. And finally, we use paper-based logbooks and forms to capture all this catch information and vessel data, giving the opportunity for all this information just to be filed away in some cabinet and lost forever. You see, we can have all the improvements in the world in terms of laws and international treaties, but if we don't have an effective way to monitor our oceans, then it's really flawed. As, as soon as we set up these marine protected areas everywhere, really the next step needs to be figuring out a way to better watch over those areas. Well, this is what I think we can do. I think this is the answer, technology. And I think that really comes as a result of the great improvements we've had in technology. And that's my whole purpose here, is to try and bring some of that over to the ocean realm. You see, technology can kind of be looked at in this S-curve form in terms of adoption. And basically, all this is saying is that as the number of people who start using the technology more and more, it slowly builds and gets to this kind of critical point, and then plateaus once it's hit the mainstream. And if we look over the last 100 years, we've seen that it's followed this basic same S-shape. But what I wanted to point out was, as the decades progress, you see technology adoption accelerates. And I think we've all kind of seen this in the way that the computers and cell phones have really changed our lives in the last 20 years. So right now, we're living in this zone. We're living in this amazing time right now where a tech entrepreneur can create something that can change not only his industry, but the world in months and not decades. You see, before, to be a technology entrepreneur, you had to have access to a factory or all sorts of capital to do something. Well, now we're in the state where you can design something, you can get it, a prototype printed out by a 3D printer, and then you can send that file off to be manufactured at a factory all without even leaving your couch. So this is what I think we need to do to change this problem. Now, it's kind of a busy chart, but I want you to look at the simplified roadmap and really get two things from it. There's two paths that we need to do here. We need to create better observation technologies, and we have to make that information that we collect more actionable. So observation technologies, we need to make use of drones and unmanned boats. We have to use the internet, and a lot of this information that we've been able to handle and, and manipulate to really bring this issue up and not rely so much on the military aspect of it. And then for building information infrastructure, it really has to be information that's actionable. Illegal fishing is a global problem, and we're attacking it in regional, in regional ways. I mean, it blows my mind that there could be a vessel shark finning in the South Pacific, and when that vessel shows up in South America, we don't always have that information there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about various technolo technologies. I'm just going to pick a, a few of them out um, and show you different ways that they can help. So the first is drones. Now, drones have gotten a lot of controversy lately with their use in the military. I think I've even, when I said the word, I saw some of you guys cower in fear. <laughs> but you know, just like uh, the internet, which kind of originally came under military funding and has been like commandeered by the public, I feel like, like drones are a technology that can help to bring conservation to new heights. I mean, there's this incredible amateur community out there that is now producing more of these planes than the US military has. And they're sharing the designs and the information and, and all the software for free online. It's this really incredible time. And there's nothing that an that a, a, a unmanned plane can do that, that we don't already do with our manned aerial planes that we use in conservation. The second thing I want to talk about is Hydrophone sensors. This is something that I made. Now, see, all vessels really make noise underwater when they move. So basically, what you see behind me is a hydrophone sen sensor. It's an underwater microphone. And, it, and the way that this thing works is it basically listens for big enough changes in the ambient noise of the water to tell that a vessel has passed by. I mean, you can kind of think about this as a um, 
those lights that everyone has above their garage, the motion sensor lights when someone walks into the area, it's a similar thing. But it can be connected to any kind of communications mechanism and send a note to someone saying, hey, something's came by. The next thing I wanted to talk about was satellite technology. So we've all kind of heard the amazing things that we've been able to do with satellite imagery. There was that recent Valley of the Cons thing that National Geographic was equipped with. And, and there was, there's also been some really interesting conservation challenges that have been solved by this, including this. So what happened here was this was a group of individuals who saw, just using Google Maps, that someone was illegally trawl fishing in the Canary Islands. And they reported it to the EU. And these people got in trouble because of it. So that's not even using specific satellite imagery. But I think that the really exciting stuff that's happening with satellite technology is the miniaturization and, and privatization of space. So this uh, CubeSat that you see behind me is a really small satellite. So this one was created by Aalborg University in Denmark. And it's basically a space-based AIS receiver. So this thing gets vessel tracking information from space, but it costs a fraction of the price of what our previous satellites costed. And we've even seen recently um, Planetary Resources did this uh, Kickstarter campaign for the space telescope. And they're miniature space telescopes, and it's widely popular. So there's no reason why we couldn't have a fleet of those orbiting our, our, our planet, taking real-time imagery of our oceans. And the final thing I wanted to talk about is something that's enabled by the current state of the internet. Um, we should be able to engage everybody out there to become better conservationists. Uh, statistics say that by 2020, over 5 billion people will be connected to the internet. And we see how um, people can do some pretty amazing things with iPhone apps and, and the web now. So I created this, which is mpaguardian.org. The focus behind this is to really try and help crowdsource the protection of our California's MPA system to anybody out there who's on the water on a boat, they catch see something, they could catch it with their iPhone and upload it to the database. So we've heard a lot about citizen science. I'm trying to think about citizen protection. And the more information we get about these areas, then we can start building a better picture and helping out the enforcement individuals that are trying to work on stopping this stuff. So instead of just arbitrarily driving out, you know, taking their vessel out into the ocean, they'll start to get an idea of what areas this kind of stuff's happening in. And they can take a more direct approach there. So those were just a few technologies. There's really a whole lot of stuff that we could be doing nowadays. Um, I, you know, I'm an engineer, and, and I really think that we're in a place right now where we need to get conservationists and engineers working together on this. You know, I, I want a situation where the bright young engineers aren't leaving school and going to work for an internet company working on better ad delivery, right? I want them trying to solve our greatest conservation and environmental challenges of the day. You know, through my work with Engineers Without Borders, I've seen what a passionate, inspired engineer can do. And I really want to bring them into this space. So thank you. It was an honor.